For more than 75 years, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield has been committed to creating stronger, healthier communities through corporate grants, sponsorships, and program support. Learn more at highmark.com slash community impact. opiates, it numbs a lot of things. You really don't have to deal with reality mentally and emotionally. Before I went to jail, I was at rock bottom. My situation with my kids, not having a home, not being with my kids and knowing that I wasn't allowed to have them because of what I was doing, that, that was rock bottom for me. I get to come back again. So you have two days, then come. Yep, so I get to see you two times this week. On a peaceful hillside in Washington, Pennsylvania, a young mother tells a story that is being played out by hundreds of women all across this community. It's the story of a woman at risk of losing everything that matters because she is addicted to opioids. It bothers me to know that they're bothered because I'm not here to know that somebody else is getting to do everything I should be doing. The opioid epidemic is ravaging communities, paying no mind to age or race or wealth or poverty. And now the crisis is beginning to hit women at an alarming rate. In recent years, heroin overdose deaths in the U.S. have tripled among women you can draw a straight line from the drug to the jail cell. Since the epidemic began, female incarcerations have increased by nearly 50%. And what percentage of those inmates have dependency problems? All of them. Opioid addiction is destructive across all demographics, but compared to men, a woman's addiction has more devastating implications. It has a profound effect and an impact on multiple areas of their lives and the community. The damage rolls out in waves, separating mothers from their children. I didn't attend her graduation, I was in prison. Estranging daughters from their parents. She's my baby girl and uh, they're worried about she's gonna die and all. bringing suffering to infants born addicted. You see them as if they're out of control in their mind. You see their eyes deviating left and right, and their heads going up and down. They're arching, they're uh, screaming at the top of their lungs. And often forcing extended family to interrupt their own lives. And now, here I am with a three-month-old opioid addicted child and, and a four and a six-year-old that I'm caregivers of, and it's, it's stressful. And perhaps most troubling of all is the emotional toll on children. I had overdosed a couple times, and he, my son had seen me. At the center of this crisis are women, stranded by addictions that are bringing a new kind of suffering and challenges to those who are closest to them. You have broken families in a different kind of broken way. Thanks, baby. I love you. Love you more. I love you more. These are some of the few moments Chantel Ardino will spend with her children this week. She was visiting the home of her father and uncle, who are raising her infant daughter and four and six year old sons. She came to share the story of how she got to this place in life, living in a halfway house and permitted just two hours of visitation each week. It all started with pills. I noticed quick how addicted I came so quickly. And I had, I definitely felt bad about it because I know what it was like to grow up with a parent as an addict. But it's like as soon as I did it the first time, I was already addicted and I didn't know what to do with it. Her story is as common as it is heartbreaking. Her mother was an addict who was often absent. 
That led her to teenage drinking and eventually to a relationship with the wrong man. And he kind of like filled that place for me of that, her not being around. And he had always supplied my drug addiction, which was pills at that time. And when I left him, I couldn't afford that. And that's when I switched to heroin. By age 24, she was drowning in it. There was an arrest, probation, rehab, and relapse. Alone with two small boys, she failed a drug test and was sentenced to time in jail. She was pregnant with her third child. In July 2017, after laboring alone in her cell, she was taken across town to Washington Hospital where she delivered a baby girl who was born two months premature and addicted. I called home one day. It was like two, two, three weeks after I had her. I called home from jail and I got told that while I was in jail that she could be possibly blind and deaf. because of what I did. And it's heartbreaking to me to see these children who are left without their parents. Washington County Commissioner Diana Irie Vaughn is sounding the alarm that the opioid crisis is getting out of control. She says many female addicts have suffered trauma, including domestic violence and abuse as children. Many have mental illness. That's a huge factor in the choices they're making self-medicating, just wanting to be numb. All of that is on top of the stresses of basic female physiology. There's certainly an emotional and hormonal element that may leave women open to addiction. Uh, the emotions of dealing with lots of the life factors. The desire to escape one's problems is nothing new. Opioid use goes back to the 1800s when babies were given opium serum to calm their cough. Some mothers tried it and became hooked. Fast forward, you know, to the 70s where it was kind of just status quo for women to maybe be taking some Valium just, just to be able to relax and handle the kids making all the noise. And now, decades later, that mother's little helper is frequently replaced by drugs that are more addictive and dangerous. It's profound. It's um, heartbreaking. It's just it's very sad. I don't know how else to say it. Washington County Children and Youth Services Director Kimberly Rogers says more and more children are being hurt by their mother's addiction. You worry about their future. Um, you know, how is that going to impact them and affect them later on in life? Of the hundreds of children the agency helps, almost 70% are in foster care. In the past several years, the number of parents evaluated for substance abuse has more than doubled. And perhaps most alarming is the rise in adoptions. The mission of CYS is to keep or reunite children with their mothers. Adoption is the last resort. Six years ago, the agency placed 22 children for adoption. This year, there will be 70. We've done drug and alcohol evaluations, treatment opportunities, in-home services, everything that we can possibly provide a family um, to be successful. The hope that this next time, you know, if they get into recovery, that this will be the time that they'll stay in recovery and be able to keep their kids. How common is that, though? It's not. The task of mending broken families rests on the shoulders of the CYS workers who face ever-increasing caseloads. They're going to have to fight that addiction, even if they are clean and sober. It's still going to be in the back of their mind. There's another one. Where? Right there. Do you see it? Chantel is in the thick of that struggle now, but she says rehab and sobriety feel different, more hopeful this time around. I look forward to going back to the halfway house. It's a blessing. There is some evidence to suggest that women have a better chance than men at long-term recovery. Maybe the reason and the answer lies in that sacred space between a mother and her child. And now I only get two hours a week. Life's too short. Everything's missing so much. They're growing bonds with other people now. 
it's so worth it. It's late afternoon in the Goat Hill neighborhood of Washington, and Michael Ardino is just home from work and ready to begin his second shift, doing something he never thought he'd be doing at this age. Nine minus four. Five. He is 55, and he is raising his grandchildren. No matter what I gotta do, I'm gonna take care of them. The two boys and an infant girl came to him after Chantel, his daughter, was incarcerated for opioid abuse. With their birth father out of the picture, the children were headed for foster care when Michael and his brother Frank stepped up. They're my grandkids, and I wouldn't want them to go nowhere else. They belong here with us. Your eyes are getting tired. Huh? Frank has become foster parent to the baby, giving up a career as a flooring craftsman and the easier life of a bachelor to care for her full time. I done what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it and with who I wanted to do it. So, you know, that pretty much tells you how my life has changed. Frank never had children of his own. Now his life is filled with bottles and diaper changes and sleepless nights. I don't know how I learned it. I just did it. They said I was a natural. I don't know if I was like babies, just never had them. As the drug crisis spreads through the female population, more extended families are making sacrifices. The goal of CYS is to keep children with kin, which isn't always easy. We will seek family and we'll say, well, what about mom? Well, mom's using too. Well, what about grandma or great grandma? Well, they used to. How about cousin? They're on something as well, or they have an extensive criminal history. This was the right home for the children when they needed one. While Frank keeps things running at the house, Michael puts in a long shift as a trash collector. There's a lot of stuff I could be doing in life right now, but I'd be at work thinking on what we're going to do next when we go home, you know, when I go home. And yeah. And they'll tell you they want to stay with Pap now. You want to be here? Oh, there you go. The baby girl was born addicted and stayed in the hospital while she went through withdrawal. The men brought her home knowing she might be blind and deaf. But the latest tests show she is neither. Can't hear, you can't see, you don't have a chance. She'll be all right. Are you gonna be all right? Probably, in a minute. Their sacrifice and willingness to help has offered Chantel the chance to remain in her children's lives while working on her own sobriety. I'm very grateful, I'm very lucky and blessed that my family stepped up because if they wouldn't have, they would have had to have been in foster care. And they have genuine love every day. Took her to the doctors and got her some children's Tylenol. They changed a lot since they've been with us. It's hard for them because what happened with the mom and dad's not around. But now we have way parents to raise kids. You know, they gotta go to bed at a certain time. They have to eat, they have this. And they adjusted to all that. It was hard for them. Knowing that they're here and that they're happy, it does make it a little easier knowing that. But at the same time, it does make me wonder too one day if, because of how happy they are here, if they're gonna wanna come back with me. It is late autumn at the Washington County Jail and the cell block is as crowded as it's ever been. When the jail was built in 1996, it was designed to house 24 women. Today, the average female population here is almost 100. I've been here long enough that I'm now dealing with some of the grandchildren, of the, the people I first met as a young officer here. It's a cycle that, that needs broken. Incarceration is almost always tangled with drug abuse and its trauma. Most female offenders are survivors of domestic violence. 82% suffered physical or sexual abuse as children. 75% have histories of physical abuse as adults, and seven out of 10 have minor children. How many of you raise your hand if you have children on the outside? Okay, 
Yes. Commissioner Irie Vaughn leads a class helping the inmates learn coping skills as they work towards sobriety and freedom. How many of you are continuing to work on your life plans? Some will get okay. out Everybody. and become okay. pregnant again. And so some of the things that we do are is go right back to the life that we mm -hmm. led. And so they want another chance to be a mom. And uh, birth control is probably not the first thing on their mind. Frequently. Not in all cases, but it does happen. It'll be more about, you know, uh, where's my next drug and, and how do I find that? And what happens to that baby? More times than not, that baby's taken and they're in our system. You know, I've seen moms with seven kids and still having kids and still not getting clean to have them. Incarceration alone is not treatment. The next step is rehabilitation, and the common 30 days or less is often not long enough. Experts believe the minimum should be 90 days in rehab, followed by plenty of support. Does she have a good place to live? Because we can help with those things. Does she have food on the table? Does she have health insurance? What are her needs in order to stay clean and sober. When we put them back into the same environment with the same people in the same community and expect them to live a different life, it's harder for them. Thelma Turner knows how hard it is to stay clean after jail. She grew up in a sober family with a strong and loving mother. As a young adult, she began smoking crack cocaine and turned to opioids to take the edge off. I wound up shoplifting quite a few times um, to support my habit. I would just go into stores, and it's really crazy, but the drug convinces you, you can get away with this. And I would just put things in a buggy and push it out the store as though I had paid for it. And I got caught. She was in and out of jail for years, each time returning to her old life and old habits. So the things that we grew up and with our morals and our values and our principles instilled, all of that has been surrendered to the choices the addict wants you to make. And you find yourself not being able to tap into that moral fiber anymore. I missed out on a a lot of key events in my daughter's life. I didn't attend her graduation. I was in prison. I didn't attend her, her graduation from college. And our relationship was very fractured. Thelma finally got the support she needed, a 12-step program and court supervision, which kept her accountable. She now has a career working with recovering addicts, and she has rebuilt her relationship with her daughter. My first Mother's Day card she gave me that said, I love you, Mom, made me cry because I didn't know she could ever feel that way about me. I just think that a lot more is expected of women because we're the nurturer. So the question is, why can't you tap into that nurturing side of yourself? It's crippled. It's paralyzed from the time you put the drug in you. A woman in the class wrote a poem about a fellow inmate, a mom who left jail and within days relapsed and died of a heroin overdose. I remember her smile as she showed me pictures of her kids and the tales she told of the silly things they did. She couldn't wait to get out of here. She'd say, man, I can't wait to hit the streets. But man, those streets are a killer. The proof now hangs off her feet. Amber is 20 weeks pregnant and is hearing the heartbeat of her son. She also has a four-year-old daughter who was with her the day Amber overdosed on opioids. There are signs there that she's been traumatized and stuff. Just what motivates me is like, you know, I just want to be the mother I know I can be and like give this baby like a chance. Yeah, everything's fine. Wonderful. She is getting that chance at West Penn Hospital through the HOPE program, which provides non-judgmental centered care, a sort of one-stop shop where women receive prenatal care and drug counseling, as well as medical treatment to prevent opioid withdrawal. When an addicted woman is pregnant and has many appointments to meet, 
Prenatal care is often the first thing to go. So 155. Yeah. Financial issues, transportation issues, um, and then sometimes giving up because they felt like there's no way I have two other children here. I cannot possibly schedule another appointment. And what we were seeing was that they were not getting OB care. People avoiding care in general because of the shame of this. And I think unless you get to a point where you recognize this is a disease that is not controllable um, or is challenging to control, then it's easy to prejudge these people. And shame is the feeling that we create for them. But the fact remains that often when a mother uses opioids during pregnancy, the outcome for the baby is devastating. It's called neonatal abstinence syndrome, and it occurs when a baby is born addicted and immediately goes into withdrawal. Some of the very common things we see are irritability, tremors where the babies are shaking their arms and their legs, difficulty eating, frequent loose stools, and then because of that sometimes their bum gets red and excoriated. As a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother, it's very difficult. Nobody likes to see any child suffer. We deal with critically ill patients here in our NICU, but the struggle for going through withdrawal seems to tug at the heart even more. The sickest babies are given a form of methadone to ease the symptoms of withdrawal. And now, as the first wave of these babies reaches school age, doctors are concerned about how the prenatal exposure to drugs will affect them. If they or when they get an exposure to an opiate later in life, it may be a much uh, more likely opportunity that they're going to be addicted to this. It's certainly a possibility that we will see that these children are at higher risk for developing bipolar disease, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Time will bring the answers, but for now, all hospitals are seeing an uptick in the number of babies born addicted, a five-fold increase since 2000. About 11% of babies born at Washington Hospital are born addicted to drugs. The trend has prompted the hospital to begin a renovation of the nursery to provide a dark, quiet space for addicted newborns. Let's see what else we got here. What's that? A bear. A bear. Good job. What? A few blocks from the hospital, a mom plays with her toddler son at a sobriety treatment house. Can you see that? Rebecca Richards came see here after she overdosed and was Sunshine. invited to bring the boy along to live with her. She stayed off drugs while she was pregnant, but then relapsed after he was born. The depression from his, everything that had happened with his father, the postpartum depression, trying to stay clean on top of it all. I just. I broke and I caved and I used. She is fortunate to be here, staying connected to her son while in treatment. The house is one of only 11 such places in Pennsylvania. Having him here has motivated Rebecca to remain sober. He's young, but he's not stupid. He knew I wasn't right. His life was being destroyed also. I hope that he doesn't ever have to experience or go through this. I'm not going to hide who I am from him. Like, he's going to know that I'm an addict and that I'm in recovery and that I got better. Get to know these women and hear their stories and see them with their kids. And you begin to understand addiction more fully. You understand how the drug latches on and won't let go, and how it silences a woman's maternal voice. It's growing so fast. Chantel has been sober almost five months, and that motherly voice has come roaring back. I have to fix me as a person before I can fix myself as a mother. I can't be a good mother to them if I'm not a good person myself. The blessings of her new sobriety are many. Sweet, forgiving children and a selfless, loving family. I mean, I want her to get better. I hope she does. She's doing very well now, but I want her to focus on her life. And she'll always have the kids. But now they're like in my life, you know. She's my family and I want to raise her and make sure she has a good life. You know, I want every generation is supposed to have something better. Even if they aren't with me, at the end of the day, I don't want them to know that I just surrendered to drugs and just 
didn't care enough about myself because even if I can't live with them, I can still be sober for me and them and still be in their life as much as possible. It's a beautiful thing to see that, seeing you getting your daughter back. She's happy too. I get to be free. I get to actually be here and not just physically be here, actually be here and watch my kids and enjoy my time with my family. I get to just be me today. I get to be okay with just being me today. I've been clean for 14 years. My uh, clean date is October 1st, of 2003. And that's the day I started to live. There's so many women that have been there and that have come out on the other side of it. Just to hold on and there's hope and there's help. I'm very happy. This is a new life for me. It's better than the first 39 years of my life. I didn't think that I was capable of doing anything and today I have a career. Um, I work two jobs. I support my kids. I'm there for them. My family's there for me and I see life through different eyes. I think I just got over the fear of the stigma that was attached to it, and I was able just to move forward with my life. Um, there's a lot of work that you have to do, but it's doable. You can't have your life in your addiction too. I had to choose one and I chose my life. For more than 75 years, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield has been committed to creating stronger, healthier communities through corporate grants, sponsorships, and program support. Learn more at highmark.com slash community impact.